want to say up front, I want to try to cut the lesson in half tonight, give you time to fellowship before you leave. But if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 44. We'll start there. We moved from the power in prayer. Now we're working through the victory in prayer. Put that in the atmosphere, the victory in prayer. It is, it is something that we continue to build on for the rest of this uh, month and going on into the new year, possibly. But I want to see us become more victorious in our prayer as seeking and knocking and seeing the, the effects of the door opening. Uh, victory in prayer. Looking at Psalms 44, I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. Real close to King James, it just gets a little brighter and takes out a lot of the old English, but it's still pretty close to what he's saying. I'm going to jump in this Psalms around verse 4 and go down to 8. And again, probably won't get to all of this, but I want you to just track with me and, and let's, let's feed on this tonight. The psalmist says, you are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will tr trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies, and you have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we boast all day long and praise your name forever. And all the people said amen. Yeah. This psalm is so beautiful, and I was reading and studying other places, but it brought me to this song and this psalm uh, written by the, the, the sons of Korah. Korah, if you study Korah in your Bible, you pick up over, I think it's in uh, Deuteronomy, the um, 16th chapter, or number 16th chapter, how Korah them came up against Moses, but yet and still there were children of that generation that sought the Lord. There's a scripture I want you to write down in your memory. It's in Proverbs 21 and 31. Keep in mind the victory in prayer. But Proverbs 21, 31 says in our, again, New King James reading, the horse is prepared or made ready, I interjected that, for the day of battle. But deliverance is of the Lord. Say deliverance is of the Lord. It doesn't matter. Victory rests on the Lord. The horse, as you know, is a powerful animal. It runs and it runs into the battle. Job says mighty is the horse that runs into the battle. The rider's on the horse, but it is going into the battle. We are moving into territory. When we say victory in prayer, then there has to be a conflict or a battle of some sort for you to have victory. Some of you are at the point of declaring full victory. Some of you are in the middle of battles, but victory is in prayer. The Lord, victory, rest it on the Lord. Various indication here is needed in this Psalms as we look at it, and it waits on God overcoming the enemy and giving victory to his people. I do want us to come to grasp this tonight. Every moment of your life and every day of your life, we're all are in a place where we're seeing something that's going on, changing our dynamics of life. Some days you wake up, it's a good day. Some days you wake up, you want to get back in the bed. But you keep going, realizing that victory is imminent because God is with you. Every day, every day. If it ain't one thing, Big Mama said, it's another. It's always something, and the devil is always cutting up. And here is an indication to you to let you know you're really close to breakthrough promises or to God when the devil starts acting real crazy. That lets you know that I'm, I must be very close to my miracle. I don't want to abort it by being depressed and being overwhelmed and miss my focus. So I must trust in the Lord and trust in the history that he ha we have in the scriptures and also with him. The beauty of this Psalms is one, is I call it a perfect gem. Psalms 44 is a perfect gem. It gives instructions and the answers to prepare for the heart of believer to prepare or to how to pray, I'm sorry, during times of distress. And the chief musician here is speaking of Korah and the mischild, the mischild of the Levites. The mischild of the Psalmist, the mischild, that particular word, it comes up as instructions 
from time to time in various psalms. Someone told me that they thought David wrote all the psalms. No, he did not. David did not write all the book of psalms, but he wrote and he identifies with various psalms. But here we see the sons of Korah. This song denotes the, um, the enforcing of some lesson, Miss Chow. So enforcing of some lesson of wisdom and how we can see the poeticness of this song and encouraging us to understand. Somebody say understand. That's all this psalmist is talking about tonight is that I'm going to help you and I understand the victory in, in prayer. Victory in prayer. If you, in Psalms, uh, uh, where I have yesterday, 44, go to Psalms 47 and look at verse 7. Psalms 47, look at verse 7. For, Psalms 47, verse 7. Ready? For God is the king of all the earth. Psalms 47, is that right? God is the king of only my neighborhood. And everything in the earth, God is king over. So whatever's bothering you, guess what? God's the king over it. So if you know he's king or lord over it, your job and my job is a lot of part of this Psalms 47, 7. Sing praises with understanding. So if you know God is over it all, you don't come to church singing the blues. You don't get up every morning and say, oh me, oh my. God's over your job, he's over the employer, he's over your lack of money, money thereof. Whatever you're going through, God's over it. Do like this, say he's Lord over my life. So I am to come and sing praises. And I don't think there's not anyone in there that can beat me praising him. <laughs> can I get any takers tonight? Okay, let's keep going. So Paul says it like this, understanding. And he wants us to see in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians 14 and 15. Pray, uh, the victory in prayer. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with an understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, New King James Version. He said, then I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with an understanding. There's a time you come and worship in prayer and praise and singing. You just don't sing the song because you're following call and demand, call, uh, call and response. You sing with an understanding. Say this with me. What a mighty God we serve. When that thing cascades down into your bones and you sing that with understanding, even if you don't sing, hum it, just talk the words, but you sing with an understanding. It's, it, the writer is saying here in 2 Corinthians 14 and 15, he says, um, if I praise God only in the spirit, in other words, I'm speaking in a heavenly language or I'm praising in a heavenly language, then how can those who do not understand me understand my praise? So I can speak, seek, sing and speak and praise in tongues, and I can sing and speak and praise in English. But both should be, those both should be dual in my life so one would understand why I'm singing and why I'm singing in the spirit, why I'm singing in my heavenly, my, in my natural language, language. They join together and give thanks to God with an understanding, and I'm saying praise be the Lord. The writer gives us confidence in this Psalms 44 that God will raise you up and help his people, which we are his people. He sees this throughout the whole Psalms and he's letting us see that God's going to help you. Say, God's going to help me. Because it's here in his word. I want you to go back to Psalms 44 if you're not back there yet and go back one page or go back over to one chapter and he shows you how God helps his people in Psalms 43 and verse 5. He asks the psalmist the question, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. What an understanding. When you command your soul to praise the Lord. When you tell your soul, you're not going to be depressed. You're not going to take me there. I'm not going that low because it took me too long to get up here. So, so, what's wrong with you? 
the writer is having an internal dialogue. I come to find out and discover over time of being in church that everybody that's quiet is not sad. I get it. Some people are just very subdued and very quiet until it's their birthday. And something comes out that you're happy about it. But you do not forget who gave you another birthday. So whenever you get a chance to break that quietness, it should be first of all, thanking the Lord for another birthday. Internal dialogue, the psalmist is having, why are you so cast down? These words are describing the agonizing soul of Jesus. In Matthew 26 and 38, you don't have to go there, I'm just gonna pass through this. He brought the same thing to us in Matthew 26, in Matthew 26 and verse 38 about his soul. And he said to the disciples, he said, my soul, in Matthew 26 and verse 38, is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Could you guys pray with me, or watch me as I go over a yonder and pray? He's caught between a soul breaking, but God is the answer and the victory in prayer. Luke picks it up in 22 and verse 44, New King James again. And being in agony, he prayed. More earnestly or intensely. And to sweat was as it were, as it was, as it were, great drops of blood flowing down to the ground. Prayed till he became totally a flux, where his pores were opening up and sweat and blood was coming out. Praying until the blood vessels began to break within him and out comes blood and sweat. A place of agony and pain. Asking the Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I really don't want to do this. I've never sinned, I've never tasted of sin, but I'll taste it if you ask me to taste it for all men, but still not be a sinner. If you put this on me, I'll do it. He's in this agony and praying and, and asking God, could he get out of this? The intense, intensely prayer is one of struggle or conflict. You ever prayed when you didn't feel like praying? You ever prayed when you were tired of praying? Asking God for stuff you haven't seen happen yet. But then you got to the point of an intense prayer that I'm not getting up until I get an answer from God. The agony of this is that the assembling of his heart was turned towards God. He wanted God to take him out of this struggle place. The victory was in prayer. Christians go through this all the time. We're, we're fighting, trying to spread the gospel. We're, we're contending with trying to live a victorious life. Praying over things that keep capturing me and pulling me back under. Asking God, break me free from this stronghold. Now, uh, well, I'm talking up here now. Y'all just listen. Move me from this thing that's dragging me back down because I can't get away from it. Help me out, Paul. Okay. When I would do good, evil is always present. And the good that I would do, that I find myself not doing. That that I not want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Prayer will get you out of it. Prayer will pull you through it. Philippians, Paul, the writer there, Paul, in Philippians, jumping out of Luke and Matthew, going to Philippians 1.29, for to you it is, has been granted, Philippians 1.29, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. If you're going to have victories, you're going to have some battles. It's not going to all be easy, but his yoke is easy, and his burdens are light. It's going to be suffering for his sake, but it's also going to be glory. Christ, in this place of struggle, Matthew 26 and 38, Christ was at, at, at the point of death struggling in this garden of Gethsemane. And here comes the part that really increases the struggle. He asked them in Luke 22 and 46, he said, Why? He said, don't sleep. He said, you better pray that you don't enter into temptation. So we're praying now for what might or what will or what's coming down the road because temptation will hit us all. But the victory is, is, in, is in prayer. Luke 22, 47, 48, and he talks about the biggest and the greatest and the most familiar kiss in history. 
and it's the kiss of betrayal. And it's when Judas comes over and kisses Jesus to identify him to the soldiers, him to be taken away. So I don't know all of what Jesus was dealing with in his mind of going through this Gethsemane experience. Taking to the cross, bearing the bear of sins, or dealing with the kiss of an enemy. But it all had to be very depleting and emptying that he needed to pray to his father to get out of this position of downcast of spirit. The psalmist is talking to us in Psalms 43 and 5. And why are you cast down, soul? How did you get here, soul? Elijah, why are you in this cave? 1 Kings 19, 9. I didn't build you for a cave. I built you to be a prophet. Elijah in 1 Kings 9 and and, and uh, 1 Kings 19, 9 and 10, he goes to an episode of trying to explain why he's there. You know how we get. Elijah says that, well, the, 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 I'm jealous of the Lord in 1 Kings 19, 9, victory and prayer. Stay with me. And, and the children of Israel have spoken and broken the covenant and have torn down the altars of God, 1 Kings 19 and 9. And he says, and I'm the only prophet left. Elijah, why are you faking like that? That ain't really what the problem is. The problem is in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 7. You're scared of Jezebel. You're running because she says she's going to take you out. You find yourself giving credit to something that really don't need credit. Instead of dealing with the real problem and pray about that problem. And try to make everything else the problem that's not the problem. Maybe it's just me. So why are you disquieted? So Psalms 43 and 5, why are you disquieted? Why are you so full of anxious anxiety and unease and restless and discontent, discontented or dissatisfied? He tells them in Psalms 43 and 5, hope in God. Put the in the atmosphere, hope in God. Hope in God. No matter what it looks like, keep your hope up. Keep your hope up. Hope in God, because he's the ultimate cure for the actions of distress. Hoping in God is the ultimate cure for the actions in distress. No matter how blink or how dark things look or how it appears, I'm sitting in front of you tonight to let you know you can hope in God. Amen. It is true, he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. There are places where it looks like you're never going to make it through. There's witnesses all around you, but they can sit here tonight and tell you, look right here. Here is a living epistle and a testimony. You put your hope back in God, you'll go from broke days to blessed days. You go from down days to up days. You go from lonely days to happy days. Your whole life will change when you put your hope back in God. Discouraged, heart sad, put your hope back in God. Psalms 43, I know where I'm going, five. We're coming to Psalms 44. It says, praising God again is what is healthy for the believer. It changes the internal dialogue of despair to confidence back in God. Try it every now and then when you're really feeling bad or like things are just out of whack. Just put on some good Christian music and turn it up real loud and just start stomping around your house and to your neighbor. Turn it up to your neighbor, come over and knock on your door and you will see that you shifted your internal. I can't go inside of you. you you're internalizing all that. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But if you turn that volume up another way, You'll find yourself going from sad to glad, from zero to 100. Am I in the right church tonight? Am I in the right church? You'll find yourself being happy, and you have to try to turn down the happiness. Because the more you think about what God has done and how he has brought you and where he's brought you from, it leads into another thing. And before you know it, you got a whole praise service going on. Let's get to it. Psalms 44. 44. And verse 1 through 4, I'm going to try to get through these three verses before I close. i got 10 minutes here. This verse here expresses humility. That the person is carrying weapons, understand that their fate is in God's hand. I have weapons, but I understand 
It ain't going to work. Not in this case. My fate is in God's hand. If God doesn't deliver, there'll be no deliverance. I can't whoop all these demons. <laughs> I've, I've been fighting them a long time. Kill one, they spit in half, become ten. The demons, they spirit, they can't even kill them. Just hit them, they scatter. But you can rebuke them and shut them down. <laughs> they can't say nothing. But they can't even talk to you. Every now and then you got to tell the demon, talk to the hand. Don't talk to me. Just shut up. Be quiet. Psalms 44 verse 1. I think I got it in New King James. We have heard what our eye, our ears, oh God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. I remember Mother Tommy House. My dad, Woolly House. I remember... G. Grady Benton, Norman Wagner, Clarence Moore. These, these, are, these are, are the Hall of Famers that have gone on to be with the Lord. But he used to tell me about how you got to go through some things, but God will bring you out. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Said, well, you, I know you love the Lord. You're on fire. Every time the service goes, you jump and you shout. And, it's all right. There's a test you're going to go through. You're going to feel like God has forgotten all about you. Like you're walking this thing along. But I'm telling you right now, from days of old, he will bring you out. And you'll come out stronger and more victorious than you ever have. I'm telling you, our fathers told us the deeds. So that's what we need to do today. Tell people about the deeds of God. Pass it on. Don't keep it to yourself, but testify to others about the deeds of God. Young single parents are coming to the church. Young single young ladies, young single young men coming with their children to the church, getting saved, wondering, okay, I did all this in the world, now I'm coming to church. Can I make it in church with these children? Can I raise these children? Yes, you can. There's a witness in it to tell you, you can make it. You don't have to sell yourself short. God will protect you. He'll be there for you and he'll provide for you. He will. We've heard about this. You drove out, verse 2, the nations with your hand. By them you planted. You afflicted the people and cast them out. Psalms 44 and verse 3. But they did not gain possessions of the land by their own sword. Nor did, they, nor did their own arms save them. But it was the right hand, your arms, and the light of your countenance. Because favored them. That's my run right there. That's my run. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. It's amazing how people don't think you're favored, but the Bible tells me here, you're favored. And once that mercy and favor is on you, it's a target, but the enemy can't do too much with you. Um, Bishop Michael Pitt said it like this, it was not the coat of many colors that made Joseph favored if you know that story. It was the guy in the coat that made him favored. Because he lost the coat in part of his house and he lost, well, he lost the coat in the pit. He lost the coat again in part of his house. So evidently, he did not get the coat back, but he got a whole royalty back. So it wasn't in the coat. It was what was inside the coat, which was him. So the favor is not what you see on the outside. The favor is on the inside. That's why the devil doesn't like you because you're favored. Watch this. Where's God's favorite child tonight? See, look at that. Everybody going to put up two hands or three hands. But the favorite child knows that God will always see about you. I don't care where you're at or what you're going through, how bad it looks. God's got you pinpoint with a GPS. I'm going to find out where you're at. If the devil mess with you too much, I'll shut him down for six months. I'll give you a smooth month and a month and a half or three months of just nothing but peace. Because the favor of God. This favor here, church, is grace favor, or free grace. Free grace favor here is exalted. It's the favor of God, free grace, free grace. But God is putting this, this, this narrative here together in human power, or human understandings. It is the manifestation of God's divine power to grace you by, your, by, by this very aspect of his favor on his people. He shows that he loves us. And if he loves you, he's going to look out for you. It's a sincere source that God here says that I have your best interest no matter what. I favor you. Lord, it was not my hands, it was yours. 
It was not my arms, it was yours. It was not my power, it was yours that saved Israel. Scripture goes on, I'm gonna run past these scriptures in Deuteronomy 4, 34. They didn't have the power to do it, God did it for mighty and great armies were against them. Deuteronomy 21 through four, another great army, a battle was against them. Enemies came up against them. More powerful, Deuteronomy 20 and 21 through four, please read that when you get home. Horses and chariots and people, numerous, he said that was outnumbering them. He said, do not be afraid. I don't want you to go to this battle afraid or fearful. Know for sure that God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. If I brought you Egypt out the world, I'm here also to take you into the full promise. So shall, he says, be, he said, for the vengeance of God is with you. God is there fighting for you. He said to Israel, he says, I am your God today. He says, I will give you vengeance over the enemy in every battle. This is Deuteronomy 20. I'm just dropping through the scriptures in verse 4 particularly. He said, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Deuteronomy 20 and verse 4. I'm going before you and I'm going to get out in front of whatever you think you're facing I'm going to fight that thing for you. He says, and I'm going to come up against every enemy that's against you, and I'm going to save you. So the Lord didn't put me in this to kill me. No, no, no. I put this in you, in this in you to save you. I'm not going to lose you in this battle. I'm going before you to give you the victory and to save you. Because God has done this for us. He's gone before us, and God is with us. He's defeating the enemy. He is a consuming fire. It is still the same today as it was of old in Zacharias 4 and 6. Not by might, nor by power, by my spirit, says the Lord. It is this prayer of Psalms 44, the prayer of victory, that reminds us of our confidence that we can have in God. Psalms 44 and verse 4. I made it. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Are you back there with me? You are my king. God, you are El Shaddai. You are my ruler. You are my leader. You are my defender. That's what I got out of it. My savior, my God, and my king. Command victories for Jacob. If you know little or much about Jacob, his life was one filled with trickery always had some game going on. But even in the midst of that, God's hand was on him. Here now, some 20 years later, Genesis 32, the angel of the Lord comes to Jacob and says, go back to your country, to your homeland. He leaves Laman's house. He leaves Laman's house loaded down. The angel tells him to go and calls him to a place. He calls the place that the angel called him to, Mihas, Mihamas, Mihamas, Mihamai, Mihamai, M-A-H-A-N-A-I-M. He calls it by the name of a camp where God met him at. The host of heaven meets Jacob in Genesis 32 and assures him of the promised protection as he returns to Canaan. Victory in prayer, victory in prayer, victory in prayer. He hears Esau is coming and Esau his brother that he stole the birthright from has 400 men that's coming to meet him so I, I don't know about you but Jacob probably was thinking I don't want to meet this guy right now I mean I got my family and my wives and all that but my little stuff that I've mastered but amassed but here this guy coming with 400 men to meet me I didn't know what Esau was up to he didn't know and his trickery continues on so he takes his, his, his camp of his family and breaks him into two camps. Y'all go that way, I'm going to go this way. And then maybe he'll jump on y'all, he won't come after me. And I'm not worried about... But in this trickery, this is, he's still playing this game, but God already promised him that I'm going to be with you. Because I know who you are. I know who I am, and Esau can't take out my promised blessing. Apart from God's plan, we are nothing. We cannot make it. We will be just wiped out automatically. But now he prays this prayer in Genesis 32, verse 9 through 12, victory in prayer. This prayer reminds me of Luke 22 and verse 44. It's an earnest prayer. It's one that has intensity behind it. Watch the prayer in Genesis 32, verse 9. 
Jacob said, O God, my father of Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal with you. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercy and of all the truth which you have shown. Hmm. Your servant, for I cross over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. You see it? I'm still not trusting your process. I still got to make sure I'm going to get out of this alive. But in this prayer, he says in verse 11 of Psalms 32, but deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he comes and attack me and the mother with the children. Oh, poor Jacob, getting sentimental. It's the children and the mother. He's going to attack. But it's really, you scared him yourself. Verse 12, watch it in 32, and I'm there. For you said you would surely treat you well. I would surely treat you well. And make your descendants as the sands of the sea, which cannot be numbered or multiplied. He remembers the prayer, but he's still not sure what God is doing. He repeats the promise back to God because he remembers the prayer that God told him when he started. Your prayer and your victory in prayer is to pray back to God what he said when you started. When you started out, you had all the promises secured and sure that God would never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with, there with you. But now you're in between the journey and the enemy is trying to make you forget what God promised you. But Lord, you said you're going to make me innumerable. You said you would not let the enemy take me out. The prayer is in Genesis 28 and verse 15. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. That's a promise. Your promise is to come back and say, Lord, you said nothing will overtake me. You said you would stand with me in the six and seven trouble. You said you would be there with me on this journey and bring me back to this place. Many winds and turns and twisting corners, but you promised to be with me. And now I've got to face Esau. And I don't know what he's really going to do. But God fixed that thing. Say tonight, I decree. In the name of Jesus, victory will be my portion. In the name of Jesus, forever, victory will be my portion. The Bible says in, in Genesis 33 and 4, when he met Esau, Esau kissed him. You remember the other kiss? A kiss of betrayal. This kiss was a kiss of friendship. Jacob tried to give him his stuff. He said, I don't want none of your stuff, brother. I got enough stuff. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you some stuff. God will bless your socks off. He will help people that you think trying to hurt you come and bless you. When you think you down to the last and it's over, God will turn that thing in your favor. But he prayed that prayer and he came back to God. He says, Lord, you said there shall not a man be able to stand before me all the days of my life. You said you would give me the victory, and right now I don't feel very victorious. I don't know what's going to happen in this next hour when I meet this man, Esau, but you know already that you're turning this heart. I hear the Holy Ghost saying tonight that God got somebody's heart turning to your favor. He's fixing things that you think is going to break you down, they're going to break you through. I see you going back to that same job that fired you, and they're going to rehire you and give you promotion. You better hear me tonight in the name of Jesus. When God's favor is on your life, the enemy can't stop you. I need five people to say unstoppable. 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 Turn around, look at somebody and say unstoppable. You have so much favor on you that it's a shame. It's a shame to have that much favor in your life because you're not living like you have favor. Your joy and your expression should be that I don't care what it looks like. I'm coming out of this with favor wrapped all around me. It's not the coat, it's what's got, what's the coat is on. Favor is on your life and God has promised it to you and you will be victorious in the name of Jesus. Hold your hands up. Father, I bless you tonight. Thank you for your word. Oh, what a blessed assurance. 
What bold confidence that I could face something like this and yet be sure to know that I'm coming out all right. What confidence. What assurance. I don't know why you favored me. I thought to put favor on my life. I don't know how you keep allowing me to escape the hands of men and the hands of the enemy. But I thank you. Oh, yes. I thank you. Your grace is so sufficient. You are amazing to me. I can't figure you out. Your love is so everlasting. You keep doing great things. You keep making the way. God, thank you. Thank you. Repeat after me. I will say of the Lord, He is my God, my strength, and my refuge in the time of trouble. Give God a praise in the house. Come on, stand if you can. If you feel like standing. Go tell two people, God's amazing, I'm telling you. The more I serve him, the more I live for him, the more I give to him, he is amazing. My God. My God. Look at somebody and prophetically make a move and say, he got me out of that one too. He got me out of that one. I don't understand. Y'all didn't move nowhere. <laughs> got me out of that one too.